Hi everybody and welcome back to Mr Allred's five minutes on. Today I'm going to be discussing Alton Mayo's theory of motivation, um, the Hawthorne studies. Um, so in the 1930s Mayo considered the work of Taylor, the scientific management approach, and noted that financial incentives do work to some extent, but he felt that there was more that provided motivation and he wanted to look deeper in this. So what he did is he went to the Western Electric Company in Chicago. They were heavily based in the scientific management approach. Uh, and between the years 1927 and 1932, a five year study, what he really did is messed with all of the ways in which the business operated and measured the response in terms of productivity and output. Um, so what he did is over those five years, he looked at things like incentive schemes, he looked at rest periods, he looked at hours of work, he looked at heating and lighting on the flat factory floor and measured the impact that changes in those dynamics had on output. Well, what actually happened is in each change, he observed that output rose. This included when he went back to the original state. So if we put the heating up, output rose. If he went back to that original state, output rose. So what he actually noted was that there was very little effect of conditions and pay on output. He felt that there was no effect. And actually he called on this the Hawthorne effect, basically saying that when these changes are made, yes, it output rises, but that's not the reason why that happens. And that's not what actually sustains it. What his conclusions really were is he found that productivity is mainly due to the increased communication and greater cohesion of teams. He really looks at, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy, that love and belonging, that teamwork element, and he looks at that and he says, really, that, that's what encouraged productivity to be higher. It wasn't these changes that we did, it was something else, because if we went back to the original, there was still that boost in productivity. What then happened is when we look at the application of his theory, um, he decided that really productivity is all about personal satisfaction of employees. If we can meet the personal satisfaction of employees, then actually productivity is going to be high. So what he proposes that managers must work with and communicate effectively to employees. Now, this is 1930. So this is this is a relatively radical thing because before that, People in organizations have really been seen as, as part of the machine. It's very hard HR in that respect. And now he's saying, actually, that he's breaking that panic paradigm and he's saying, let's, let's communicate effectively with staff. And what we really want to do is align our interests because what, what used to happen is that workers were seen as a very theory X type of worker. They're motivated by money. They're not, they don't really like work. They're very lazy. Well, he's saying, well, actually, that might not be the case. A manager's view of them might be different. So let's align the goals of those two individuals. Let's make those two individuals' goals the same. Let's communicate effectively. And actually, that should have a greater impact on motivation. And that makes a lot of sense. So he said, let's put them into work groups and let's have that dynamic and let's give workers the idea that they're allowed to make decisions and they're allowed inputs into that decisions. And that should then create buy in for that decision and see that theory going through into full practice. They should be able to see their ideas through into the factory floor or through into the business. And therefore, that should provide them extra motivation and extra zest to push forward with that idea. This has been continued to use. Volvo uses this a lot within their factories. They have work teams of eight to 10 that are responsible for building parts or whole cars. It used to be, it's now mainly parts of cars. But there's some problems with this theory. You see, it assumes that managers and workers share the same goals. Are workers more theory X than theory Y? Theory X is there for a reason. Because in some cases, that might be true. Well, in that case, giving these people responsibility is not something that they want. It's not something that they feel would be beneficial to them. And therefore, the decisions that have been made on the back of that and the comments coming out of those work groups might not actually be beneficial. In theory, communication between those directors of an organization and the staff of an organization should break down barriers. But the question could be raised is actually this, this adding to more barriers. Because if I'm a worker and I see this, this person who's in my work group, who's a director, who's on a lot more money than I am and making similar sort of decisions and similar comments that I am, does that add a greater barrier of communication? Does that make me resent that person more and therefore not listen to their point of view and not really agree with them actually when that could be the right direction to go in? 
finally, it's argued that it's very biased towards management. And if we think about it, that is actually true. It's a bias towards management. Criticism is that workers are manipulated into being more productive. The argument, therefore, is actually things like trade union power has been eroded, it's been taken away, and therefore workers are still seen as hard HR, it's still seen as they're a cog in a machine, but with a, a fancy frilly outline, if you like, where they get a bit of say, but really it's managers manipulating them to say what they want them to say and do what they want them to do for the benefit of the business. So this is my five minutes on Alton Mayo's Hawthorne theories. Uh, please like the video and please subscribe.